Hi there. This is Dan. I'm the producer of Mark and Carrie. We wanted to tell you about another show we think you might like. It's called Trending Globally. The show explores some of the most pressing policy challenges in the world today and looks at some of the most innovative solutions to them. Our last episode was about how to make difficult decisions with economist Emily Oster. Our next episode features a conversation with Brian Atwood. He's the former head of USAID, and we talk about why it's so hard to provide effective long-term aid to fragile states like Haiti, Ethiopia, and El Salvador. You can find that episode next week and all our other episodes by subscribing to Trending Globally, wherever you listen to podcasts. All right. Thanks. Here's Mark and Carrie. Well, hello there. Welcome to our late summer edition of, uh, of Mark and Carrie. I'm still stuck in the basement, as you can see. <laughs> I can see. You're looking paler and paler by the week. Yes, I, I am becoming basically a translucent <laughs> sheet of middle-aged man flesh as I'd slowly Whoa. disintegrate in, in, the, in the basement. Do they put a little bit of food underneath the door every so often? No, no, I'm just starving myself thin, oh. <laughs> you know, as generations of models have done before me. Yes. So what's been going on? Wow, it's you know it's a real downer of a um, of a last few weeks. It's hard to find very many light spots here. I think what I have been noticing, and I'm sure you have too, in the news is of course these the images and uh, newsreel coming out of Afghanistan and just the total desperation that you're seeing of people clinging to the air force planes. The, the you know. Um, people protesting in the streets uh, of the fall of Afghanistan. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, I'm going to ask you to put your political science hat on this and your sort of beltway junket uh, experience, etc., and tell us why this matters for Biden electorally. Yeah. See, here's the thing. I see the entire sort of foreign policy establishment in flames mm -hmm. because what Biden has basically done is said, oh, you know everything we've been doing for the past 20 years? It's bullshit and we're not going to do it anymore, right? And he was egged on in many ways, I think, by Trump because Trump was the one who originally wanted to withdraw and was talked out of it, right? So there is this kind of foreign policy establishment view of like credibility and commitment and so on. And Biden has just torn up the script. Now, there's a huge amount of stuff in the press about how he's going to pay a price for this. I'm just not sure that he is. I mean, I think that Trump showed that you can basically poop all over your allies and never pay a price. In fact, you actually get bonus points for it. And I'm going to find it hard pressed to translate, even if people keep saying the word Saigon over and over again. I mean, Saigon was 50 years ago, right? Most voters do not have an actual memory of the helicopters and the Saigon in 71 yeah. and so on and so forth, right? So um, is he really going to pay a price for this? What do you think? Well, I mean, I agree with you on the American electoral landscape is that I think that Americans are really bad when it comes to foreign policy in terms of evaluating and then voting against or for a particular candidate when it comes to that. In fact, I think almost all political science uh, research shows that foreign policy is almost the, is always domestic policy and always the economy and wallet issues that uh, that move people. So I so I think there there's. In terms of the electoral price, very little that he'll pay. In the moment, of course, is the chattering class really, um, you know, tearing him apart and the images that that we're getting. But how long lasting that is? I mean, you know, in comparison to COVID, this has now been going on for almost, you know, a year and a half, and where Americans are so tired of it. Let alone a place where I don't know very many of us could even point to it on a map where Afghanistan is. I unfortunately, I think it is a blip on the radar when it comes to just, you know, the things things that we care most about in our, in our lives. I wanted to double back to a point that you were just making, though, about the foreign policy establishment and this like U.S. military occupied military complex that has been built up. And just the articles that you read that essentially Halliburton was keeping Halliburton slash the U.S. was keeping Afghanistan you know, working and just with all of their contracts. So I, it's an interesting, of course, there's this humanitarian disaster that is unfolding and happening. But I think that if the Biden administration, and this comes from just um, reports, had said we're going to pull out in two years or 10 months or whatever, it would have been more lives lost, more engagement with, uh, with the Taliban. And so to do it in a way that he's doing now, it's to your point, just tearing up the script and saying, we need to get out now and cut our losses. 
So this raises a, a bigger question. I mean, quite rightly, most people are focused on, as you say, the unfolding humanitarian tragedy of essentially saying to people, particularly sort of, if you will, the educated classes in Kabul and the other cities, or oh, we'll protect you. You can have a Western lifestyle. You can have all the perks of modernity, women in the labor force, equal rights, absolutely. And then you just hang these people out to dry, right? That 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 is what mm-hmm. is going on. But let's think about the sort of the geostrategic side of this. I mean, is this the end of his, as you kind of put it there, it was someone, you had a nice turn of phrase for it, the American sort of occupy and invade complex type stuff. I mean, we went through the whole thing of failed states. That was the literature that paved the way, right? Then there was the whole rogue states. Then there was 9-11, we have to invade the rogue failed states. And then we get into democracy promotion and state building and so on. And, you know, from the point of view of other places in the world, you can call this what you want, but it's just yet another large imperial power basically pushing its weight around in the periphery in order to keep people in line. Yeah. Now, has Biden torn up that script? Because if he has, that's actually really significant. Yeah, I agree with that. And you also wonder if in this moment, and I don't want to go too far down this track because because it's just full of question marks for me, but is this a sign of, you know, a world power in slight decline? And you see that it really only cares about quote unquote dem- democracies and citizens of democracies and anybody else and a failed state. It's just it's we won't support anymore because there's too many there's too many other things that are taking up resources and time. I, I that I I again I I hesitate on that because it feel it feels so dark to me and sa- and sad. Yeah, no, I agree. And also, you know, someone said to me on Twitter the other day, how come you're not saying anything about Afghanistan? I said, because anything I would have to say is reductive, secondhand, ill-informed, and probably nonsense. So, you know, I don't have much to say either because it is an unfolding humanitarian tragedy, but it does require us to think this is what America is doing and this that's the unprecedented side basically calling it quits. Yeah. He said, you know, no, America's called it quits before. They called it quits in lots of different places. Uh, but this seems to be a kind of almost, the Brits had this, it was called the East of Suez moment after the Suez Canal crisis in 56, where they basically said, yeah, we're not going to pretend that we've got global aspirations. We're not going to pretend anything. And it's kind of weird because, of course, the other side of this is the whole signaling to China, you're a strategic competitor, and we're going to build up the Pacific and all that. Do you need to basically pull down Afghanistan in order to do that? It's definitely sending mixed signals around the world. Yeah, I was curious about the China question as well and what role China then plays in the state. Well, uh, you know, if you really want to be Machiavellian about this, right, what you're basically doing is by destabilizing Afghanistan, you're getting payback to the Pakistanis who've been arming the Taliban forever because now they become their problem. And you've got now basically the Taliban who've proven themselves to be a highly effective infiltrating guerrilla army camped straight on China's western border in their most Mm -hmm. sensitive area. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's a certain way of looking at this whereby it's like, okay, it's your problem now. Well, and then it'd be interesting, of course, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I don't want to say too much either because it would be ill-informed. But I mean, to think that the, of course, the former Soviet Union got their asses kicked there at the U.S. And when, now would it be China's turn to, to, try, to do, try to do something different and have a different outcome? Well, you know, the one thing, China will not be silly enough to try and invade and transform the country. But that doesn't mean that basically you can't start to see more armed insurrections in the Western provinces with arms and people in training, etc., flowing over that border in a way that yeah. it wasn't happening before. So one to yeah. watch. Something else to watch is the change in, here's <laughs> the segue, the change in America's demographics. We have become more racially diverse. But at the same time, it's like gerrymandering time to make sure that white people hang on to power just a little bit longer. So what's going on with all that? I mean, we have, I mean, this is something we've talked a lot about just in terms of gerrymandering. But yeah, I mean, the the numbers are starting to come out and use, and there's these cool maps sort of showing where things, demographics have changed and how the country itself has has changed as well. So what are, what are the main changes? Tell me what the main changes are. So increase in Asians, increase of Hispanic and Asians in counties and states that we were not just in New York, not just along the um, the coasts, 
And, um, and I think that by just looking at that, we would think that electorally, this would benefit the Democrats. But because, of course, our old friend gerrymandering, this has, uh, this has allowed for more gerrymandered districts to essentially, uh, pack, uh, districts full of people of color and then pack districts full of white people to maintain the, uh, to maintain the balance of power that we currently have. And I think it favors Republicans like four or five seats, something like that, um, overall. Yeah, and I'm, t- I'm tempted not to read too much into that because, you know, to go back to other conversations we've had, it turns out that people of color can be conservatives too. Yeah, right? you know amazing, this default right? ass- this default assumption that's sort of like, oh, you're you're a not white person, so you must vote Democrat. I mean, we know that's wrong. The election last time clearly showed that. So there is that effect. So you wonder how much of this is kind of you know um, trying to protect for a threat that actually isn't there. In the sense that just because you're not white person doesn't mean you're not going to vote Republican. So there's that aspect to it. Um, the other thing that I think is, is, is fascinating then becomes, you know, people like Hawley and others inside the Republican Party who are definitely, if you will, the next generation of leadership. Yes. Their strategy yeah. seems to be this thing called the white working class. Right. Yeah. They have basically, you know, they're they're for antitrust or for breaking up big companies. They want higher wages. They're basically pivoting almost completely away from the sort of the traditional low tax, small state, blah blah blah. Give everything to corporations, republicanism, and they want to double down on the white working class. But if you're doing that, then your ability to reach out to social conservatives and political conservatives who happen to be not white gets extremely circumcised. So it's a, they're finding themselves in a position whereby maybe gerrymandering is necessary because their own strategy, in a sense, is so self-limiting. But I think even if they took that same message and just did a couple, maybe a couple shifts just in wording, they might actually capture some some of those who don't, some of those um, voters that don't want big government. Big government scares them. It reminds them of a government that censors them. So, I mean, I think there's actually just a couple few smart, small things that one could do for Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton that actually might help them. But I think you're right. They're so caught up in Trump fever that they're, that they're just just not going to not going to do that. But you know, here's I just had one last thought about Trump for a second is that George P Bush, the grandson of George H W, who President Trump had made fun of both his father and his mother, went to kiss the ring of Trump and Trump ended up endorsing his opponent. So just a word to those Republicans thinking that if they kiss the ring that they're safe somehow in Trump land, like you got to watch your back. So maybe mm. a little bit of moderation might help you overall and a little bit of insurance of the voters than thinking, you, you know, you have it made once you've gotten the stamp of approval from Trump. Well, the, you know, the whole continuing long shadow of Trump it's kind of interesting what keeps this alive. I mean, what kept, what made him powerful was basically social media. So the fact that he's been booted off social media means that he gets attention to the extent that people feel that they need to pay fealty to him. And then that gets what's reported on. And I'm just wondering, do, do we ever get to a post-Trump point where you kind of forget that he's there? You know, not if you're a Republican, but like in general, like, does he ever drop out of the news cycle? Because what makes him the kingmaker is the fact that the media keeps saying he's the kingmaker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there is, there's a certain sort of self-reflective quality in this one. Well, and people think, of course, that you, if he endorses all these people and they lose, then then we won't see him anymore. But I think you're right. I mean, I think this is a mainstream media. Like, what else do they have to write about except, you know, this really this gigantic personality? Um, OK, so. I don't know if you've been experiencing higher temperatures or if you've experienced a very hot <laughs> summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I've I've noticed a few a few things. Absolutely, the f- the fact that where where I live in Providence, Rhode Island, um, July was incredibly moist. There was a lot of precipitation, a lot of rain. It was a crap month, but it was the hottest month ever that's ever been recorded. So, of course, this is the segue into last week's IPCC report, the Code Red for Humanity. So just a couple of highlights, uh, not from the report, from actually around the world. Italy had its hottest day ever, right, by about, yes. you know, one and a half standard deviations. Uh, and the town called Florida, was it called Florida? I think it was called Florida, in Sicily. And the place is famous for its little vineyard snails. Yeah. And all the vineyard snails boiled in their shells because oh. it was so hot. Uh, in Kuwait, there's a giant graveyard of tires, which is on fire. You can see from space. Uh, Siberia has already burned. Forget the wildfires in the West, right? Siberia has burned an area the size of Greece. 
And that's b- burning through the permafrost and pushing out methane, which is 80 times worse for warming, right? So as usual, you know, we're ratcheting up the temperature on the frog that we are boiling in the pot of water. And, you know, we don't care. My, my favourite WTF moment was two days after the report was released, the uh, Biden team, Blinken in particular, basically asked OPEC to pump more gas <laughs> because gas prices are too high for American consumers. So, you know, I'm looking at this supposed infrastructure bill that's going to come through of three and a half trillion, which is actually 350 billion over 10 years. It's not as big as it sounds. But a large part of this is towards decarbonization of the electricity grid and all this sort of stuff. And it's just like, why should I believe you? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, really, at the end of the day, if like the minute the gas prices go 20 cents above the comfort zone, basically you're asking OPEC to pump more gas. We have no carbon budget left, right? It is do stuff now or shit gets really bad, like above 2% mm-hmm. is already baked in. We're heading towards 3%. And, you know, yeah, we're, we're the people who care about the climate. We're going to definitely do something about this. OPEC pump more gas. I mean, it was just one of those moments where I was like, well, that's it. We're doomed. Well, and you just think, I mean, I've been thinking about this, of course, because it is so hot. And I know that, you know, all climate change is not just hot. It's like extreme weather, too. But just thinking that, you know, environmentalists used to be like, save the spotted owl. And now and that somehow was different and separate from like econo- the economy, um, economics. That's the word I'm looking for of everything. And, you know, um, democracy and like all. But like seemingly it's all interrelated. And so maybe we need to be talking about these things all together. And I guess I, I was just thinking about that as you as you talked about OPEC, that somehow maybe shouldn't OPEC be talking about this and that Saudi Arabia is going to run out of gas in the next like 70 years. And then what are they going to do? I mean, isn't that like a major destabilization in the Middle East? But I, we just have no forward thinking when it comes to this. Yeah, I mean, the Saudis are an interesting one. On the one hand, you know, they could be the Saudi Arabia of sunshine, right? Just dump enough polysilicon yeah. <laughs> panels there and like you, you become an yeah. electricity exporter. I mean, there's no reason why not. Um, at the end of the day, though, I mean, you know, there will be, Adam Tu's made this point recently, there will always be carbon being burnt for certain things. Like if you want to build a windmill, you need to have the steel and the steel requires a certain type of coking coal so far mm-hmm. at least, or at least burning gas. Uh, if Until you get synthetic aviation fuels, which are 50 years off, you're still going to be burning that when you fly around and stuff like this. So there is going to be residual carbon usage. And then the advantage goes to the lowest crop lowest cost, high quality producer. And that basically is the Saudis in the Middle East. It's forget shale and all that sort of stuff. So in a sense, they're hedged, like they're going to still have it and they can also transit. But they, like everyone else, is just like, let's put our fingers in our ears and talk about getting back to normal and totally ignore the fact that the house is on fire. So, you know, more of the same, basically. That's it, I guess. Well, speaking of houses on fire, the house of Cuomo... There's, oh, there's hey, segue. Nice segue. I like <laughs> yes. that. The House of Cuomo. That sounds like a really bad pizza shop. Her House yes. of Cuomo. Yeah, yes, yes. It doesn't give you any, because you like uh, tepid pizza. Um, it, so he resigned, go, uh, Governor, or he is resigning. I don't know. You, I think, yeah, he's in the process of resigning, but somebody else is now in charge, right? Yeah. I mean, what a scumbag. I mean, you just think what, and my that was my main takeaway, what a scumbag. And then my right. second takeaway was, it really is like, wow, when you have that many enemies, what's the saying? Like you step on shoulders on your way out and then people like push you down on the way down, whatever it is. But I just thought God, people in Albany, New York, were just so gleeful to watch the fall of him right. um, and just no friends what whatsoever. Yeah, the, the, the one of the ones that many people have pointed out, of course, is he passed this piece of legislation, which allows to turn back the clock on historic sex crimes on stuff that's passed the statute of limitations, right? With the result that uh, someone who is now 68 years old is suing Bob Dylan. I don't know if you saw this for an alleged assault when she was 12 years old, right? So, you know, it's interesting that this guy has this foresight to basically weaponize the ability of people to go after historic sex crimes while he himself is basically committing them every day. It's that level of disconnect, which I just find absolutely remarkable. And there's also something about, I don't know whether it's a class thing or a generational thing or a bit of both, but, you know, men that I know of my age, right, the idea that I would put my hand anywhere near a co-worker, right, 
I mean, like every, every, we would all be like, what did you do that for? That was insane, right? You wouldn't, you just wouldn't behave that way. You wouldn't think that way, right? And yet there's still this bunch of guys who are perhaps five to 10 years older than me who, who are still in that mindset. And his resignation speech note or whatever, where he basically said, I, you know, I recognize the standards have changed. I just didn't recognize how much. It's like, that is the worst answer ever. What you did was deeply creepy stuff. Like, and you have no way of processing how creepy that is. That, that's also what stands out for me from that. And well, it's your point about a colleague and coworker. Like, just when does that ever, I, I mean, I even hesitate to like pat someone on the arm as a colleague, like to let alone thinking about like the other creepy behavior that that he has. And I, I, you're, you're so right in that as he is mounting his own defense verbally, he is doing all the things that one is not supposed to do in terms of the victim shaming and all, I mean, everything. It was the classic case of don't ever speak. Yeah, exactly. It's like you clearly don't get it, do you? You just you still don't see why yeah. this is actually a problem. It's almost sort of like, but surely manhandling people is like a perk of the job, right? That's what I do. I'm a politician. I kiss babies and I squeeze butts. No, you don't. You don't do that. We haven't been doing that for 25 years. And right. now if you do, you yes. get called out on it. So like, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah, it was interesting to see him just like stonewall it until basically the wall fell down. Yeah, and I did wonder whether he was going to resign or they were going to have to impeach him, but I guess he had one little uh, shred of dignity um, left. Um, I wanted to do a quick wrap up of the Olympics. I don't know if you watched. Yeah, the go for it. Movie, Absolutely. I know that you watched it. I, I, I did. Let yes. The whole thing passed me by. Um, I enjoyed the closing ceremony, and then uh, here's where I wanted to go: is they handed off, you know, they hand off the flags to the other to the next country, and they handed off to Paris. And of course, they had the, this gorgeous like flyover of the Eiffel Tower. But what I was thinking most about is that next year is that the Winter Olympics are in Beijing, and you know, the Olympics are about peace and you know harmony and you know, our, we're friends and we compete in friendly competition. And I just wondered what the IOC was going to do with standing in Beijing and talking about world peace and humanity and et cetera in this country that, of course, is like has none of that happening and how it is that they're going to be able to keep a straight face. And and just thinking about, you know, the soft power that China has used the Olympics for as a vehicle to show the world that they're this like compassionate country. Um, so I was thinking a lot about that as uh, as the closing ceremony happened and um, and wonder how they will handle this all with uh, with China. And I'm sure none. I'm sure the Uyghurs will not be mentioned. I'm sure like the surveillance state will not be mentioned and all of these different um, all of these different things that, of course, China is uh, is moving forward with. Well, I mean, the obvious comparator is FIFA, right? So in 2022, we break with all tradition. We don't have them in the summer. We have them in November after 8 o'clock at night in Qatar, right? And if that isn't a case of just basically, okay, why did you do that? Oh, uh, because of Qatar's long history of soccer playing? Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, uh, because it's obviously the best place to run a tournament where people are running around, expending a lot of energy. You want a place that's boiling all the time, right? That's a, that's a good one. So clearly, you know, these organizations, you know, FIFA is, um, shall we say, had its reputation dragged through the cleaner several times recently. Change of leadership, the expulsion of Seth Blatter, the guy who, he who uh, used to run it, etc. And you know, as are the Olympics uh, in in that same bind, right? I mean, ultimately, they've got to find a place to host this. This is the raison d'etre. This is what they do. They plan this. Very few places are willing or can afford to hold Olympic events. And China is one of them. So, And they have great facilities and it'll all work brilliantly. So what are you going to do? Yeah, of course you're going to go along with it. Absolutely. But it's such an interesting point of national pride and nationalism and like all these things that we're supposed to not be in this like in you know 2021 like nationalism is bad right and we're not and but the countries have used the use the olympics use big sporting events like the world cup as a way to raise to raise as a way to raise their own morale and this oh, yeah. real point of pride too so i just think that's like all of these different angles on the olympics or world cup or what have you is are really interesting in terms of the the global political positioning of it all Exactly. Well, as we come to the end of our chat for, for this one, it is back to school time, right? You will, you will be yes. back at work. I will be back at work. Yes. I guess we actually have to talk about masks. Yeah, I guess we do. And nothing says back to school like no mask mandates. 
Yeah, that, and I think that's right. But it's kind of funny. I mean, if you look at this from the point of view of, you know, other countries around the world that are also dealing with COVID, I mean, there is this weird thing that's going on just now where I imagine people are just scratching their heads, essentially, looking at the United States and going, all right, the Afghanistan thing, right? You know, as, as a, any European lefty has basically been screaming for 20 years, this is bad, it's just imperialism, and it's going to end badly, and they shouldn't be there. Well, in a sense, wish fulfillment, right? But now you can basically say, but they're leaving all these people behind, and that's terrible, and it's like, yeah, well, you know, you, you, this is how this works out. This is obviously a horrible, messy business. What does it mean for, you know, transatlantic relations? What does it mean for NATO, right? Try to scratch our heads and all that sort of stuff. But then the really amusing and bemusing stuff is to basically watch the cultural politics of masks. Yeah. Right? Every country has a little bit of this. Absolutely. There are people in Germany who do this. There are people in Britain who do this, right? But at the same time, I mean, Britain's, I think it's 81% of people have had two shots in the UK. And basically, you know, they don't, if you watch the Premier League opening matches last week, you 30,000 people in the stadium, nobody wearing masks, right? Delta going down, right? So maybe, you know, it is actually sort of uh, overblown or whatever, but it's the ability that we've had to weaponize anything. We can turn anything into partisan competition. And, you know, we do know that Delta is more serious for kids. It's not sort of like, you know, a, a pandemic in its own right. We're not talking about thousands of kids being in hospital, but it is more serious. It is more dangerous. And, you know, just it's just bemusing why politicians would say, no, 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 absolutely not. I'm going to put your kids at risk, right? This is what I'm doing. And it's just like, really? I mean, how, how do you get away with that? I know, and just over something so silly. I mean, silly meaning it's just, a, it's a mask. I mean, we're not it's asking- a mask. Yes, we're not asking for their kidney. Nobody's saying like full bio suits yes, or anything like exactly. that. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just a mask. Yeah. So and if, if it was some sort of rule or some sort of policy regulating young women's bodies, you can be sure that they would, you know, they would. Oh, yeah. The thing. mask on everything. Yes, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. There'd be masks all over the place. Yes. Yeah, it's a funny one. I mean, how do you think about that as a as a keen observer of American politics? I mean, is <laughs> this you. just is this just pure partisanship? Basically, we will weaponize anything to keep our base riled up, or is there sort of a, a further sort of you know, is there something deeper here in terms of the way that sort of America just regard anything to do with them as an imposition and a sort of you know infringement on their freedom or something? It's very yeah. hard for me as a, as 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 somebody who grew up in Europe to get my head around this. Right. I mean, it's just it's a public health issue, right? Right. I can infect somebody else. QED. My freedom ends at the point where I impact somebody else's freedom by making them sick, right? So I I just don't get the whole freedom thing. How how do you make sense of it? I think that it's it is it is just the rile up. There's a, a certain strain that's just the rile rile up the base and keep them motivated. But I do think that there is this like libertarian streak of keep your laws off my body, except when it comes to some stuff and mostly around women's bodies, that is right. just very, that is, that is very American in that way. And that um, there, you know, we don't, are Americans and I'll just want myself and don't like this like government telling me that I have to do something, whether that is um, around my body. So whether that is put on a mask, take a, you know, take a vaccination, whatever that is. And it is this weird strand of things because it, you would think that it was exactly what you just said. If I'm harming somebody else, that if I put them in peril, that that would be somehow motivate me to, you know, be a good citizen. But in some ways it's just, we've turned our backs so much. I mean, this is, you know, of course, like all bowling alone and like social capital, all that stuff of, we just don't care about each other in that way anymore or people that we don't know. In my Twitter feed, I did see something that got retweeted about like 30,000 times. And it was a comment from someone who just said, "No, nobody should be puzzling about the fight over masks. I just remembered this, actually. Nobody should be puzzling about the fight over masks because we spent 40 years quite deliberately dismantling and attacking any sense of trust that we have in, in government and in each other. So this is, you know, this is the consequence. This is where you get when you basically hyper-individualize society and demonize the state. Of course, you're not going to trust it. And it makes it fertile ground for like, you know, there's a microchip in your arm and whatever things you want to believe this week. Well, on something lighter, I just want, this is yet another coda to what we were talking about in our last podcast, and that is when Jeff Bezos went into space, um, a lot of people were also remarking on his face in that he had been using maybe Juvederm or Botox and fillers that he looks very different than he used to. So I, I wasn't sure if you had scheduled your Botox appointment or not, but it seems to be the real thing to do for, you know, men of a certain age. I think I'm well past Botox at this point in time. <laughs> yeah. If I don't get out 
out of this basement, I'm literally going to just disintegrate. I mean, you know, this, this is not a healthy parlor. But yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, the great leveler on everything is aging, right? I mean, yeah. that's it. We're all, you all, we all get old and eventually we all die. Yeah, there we yeah. go. And, yeah. you know, despite the fact that he's got $200 million and basically built himself uh, Charlie's uh, great glass elevator atop a rocket so he could nearly get into space, um, I suppose that he feels he needs to look younger, like yes. all men of a certain age do, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I guess, you know, yeah. maybe maybe $200 billion doesn't make you happy after all. I know, right? Like, I mean, his therapist must really be puzzling over what can make you happy. Like, going to space does it. Getting a new face does it. Maybe some more internal work, Jeff. You know, I, I, I think don't know. So. Yeah. I think so. Maybe yeah. he should just give it all away. Imagine that. Yes. No, absolutely not. Well, it was nice to see you. Yes, exactly. We will be back at school shortly, so we should have our first chat sometime in September. Yes. We'll do our back to school special. You ever notice that every episode we have is actually a special? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like right. every episode and is the a summer special. special yeah so we had the uh, beginning of summer special <laughs> then we had the midsummer special we have the end of summer special now we'll have the back to school special yeah. uh, I guess then we'll we'll have to wait a while to have the Halloween special yeah, that's right yeah it's right? Just, the Thanksgiving yeah. special and the Christmas <laughs> special right everything's a special that's because we're special it's, you know it's nice yes. to be special it is thanks for listening everybody bye bye 